A man besides the elder seventy years That what he goes there for Is to unlock the door Well those around him criticize and sleep Okay, on to section 5.4, which is the second derivative test. Now, just to be clear about something, this isn't the second of two derivative tests. That's not why it's called that. And the reason I'm saying this is because this is what I thought when I first learned about this. You know how we learned the first derivative test before, and now this is the second derivative test? It doesn't mean like that we're, we're um, numbering them off. Oh, here's the first one of the test. Here's the second one of the test. The reason that other one was called the first derivative test is because you used the first derivative. The reason this one's called the second derivative is because, second derivative test is because it uses the second derivative. So it's the second derivative test, not the second derivative test. Hope that makes sense. All right. Uh, anyway, on to the second derivative test. I'm not a huge fan of this test for two reasons, which I'll go through during the uh, video here. But we do need to know it. Uh, so it says the second derivative can also be used to locate local maximum and minimum values of a function f. Uh, okay, so one reason I'm not a huge fan of the second derivative test is we already found a way to find local maximum and minimum values. It's called the first derivative test. And uh, in order to get the second derivative, you have to take the first derivative first. So it kind of seems like, well, if you already got the first derivative, why don't you just finish it off and find the maximum and minimum that way? But this is another way you can do it. Uh, all right, a little drawing here to kind of help us understand stuff. We have a function here, um, f or whatever, and I'm going to look at a certain point right here. We're going to call that point, the x value of that point, c. If I was to draw the tangent line at that point, what would it look like? It'd be horizontal, wouldn't it? So I'm actually even going to write that. It has a horizontal tangent at point c. So what does that mean f prime of c is? What does that mean the first derivative is at this point here? Well, the derivative, the first derivative is the slope of the tangent, and the slope of the tangent here is 0. Now, if you look at all the, the tangents here, you can see we have a highly negative one, and then less negative, less negative still. You get to that 0 one, then it starts a little positive, more positive, even more positive. What can you say about all the, the slopes of the tangents? They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So in other words, f double prime, the second derivative, at any point, not just c, but any point along here, must be greater than zero because the uh, slopes are getting um, bigger and bigger and bigger as we go along. And for that reason, as we've seen before, uh, last day I think it was, this is a concave up function. So it follows from that that if you have something that's concave up, that means all the tangents are going to be below it. But at this particular tangent, you have a horizontal tangent, then you must end up with a minimum value here. So we can write graph lies above all the tangents. Therefore, f of c is a minimum. Okay, this is going to be very similar. Our function here is f. We're interested in this point this time. Let's call it c again. If you were to draw the tangent at that point c, for, so the first derivative in other words, it's going to be horizontal again. So that means the first derivative at that point is equal to zero. Now, if you were to draw all the tangent lines, you have a highly positive one, less positive, less positive, you get to zero. Now, a little negative, a little more negative, really negative. They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. In other words, the second derivative of any point along there must be less than zero, which results in a concave down function. And so it follows that the graph lies below all the tangents. Therefore, f of c must be a maximum. And it, indeed it is. It's a maximum right there, right? And there's our minimum that we talked about over here. Okay, so this leads us to the second derivative test, basically just, just what we wrote here. Uh, if f prime of c, if the first derivative is zero, and f double prime, the second derivative is greater than zero, then f has a local minimum. Uh, by the way, people often get confused by this. This is another reason I don't like the second derivative test, because when the second derivative is greater than zero, greater seems like it should be maximum, but as we've seen, it's actually minimum. 
and vice versa. If the first derivative is zero, the second derivative is negative, less than zero, then f has a local maximum at c. Here's the other reason I don't like the second derivative test. If the first derivative equals zero and the second derivative also equals zero, then we learn nothing new. It might be an inflection point, but it might not be an inflection point. It's only might. So let me do an example of that. You don't have to write this down if you don't want to. But very quickly, if I do y equals x to the fourth, the first derivative would be 4x cubed. The second derivative would be 12x squared. So now if we look at when the second derivative equals zero, you divide both sides by 12, you get x squared equals zero, you get x equals zero. So what the second derivative tells us that this might be an inflection point. Well, if I draw this graph, y equals x to the fourth, I'm not sure if you know what that looks like, but it looks like, kind of like x squared, but a little bit wider at the bottom here. So it kind of looks like this. And I will tell you that that is not an inflection point. So that's one of the, I think, unfortunate things about the second derivative test. Sometimes you do all the work, and then you're left with no really useful information at all. Um, okay, so let's try finding some local minimums and maximums by using the second derivative test. So to get the second derivative, use the second derivative test, the first thing you have to do is take the first derivative. So f prime of x equals 3x squared minus 12. And then what we do is we find the critical numbers just like we did before. So that's not too bad. We want to know when this doesn't exist, it always exists, or when it equals zero. Okay, move the 12 over, divide by three, take the square root of both sides, you get plus or minus two. Now at this point, again, what I would probably do, just using the first derivative, is I would put negative two and two on here and try my uh, intervals. And if, for example, it goes increase, decrease, then I have a maximum. If it goes decrease, increase, then I have a minimum. To me, that doesn't seem too hard to do that. But the second derivative is another way you could do this. So what you do for, for the second derivative test is you take the derivative of the first derivative. So that would just be 6x. And then what you do is you see what does f double prime of both these critical numbers equal? f double prime of 2 and f double prime of negative 2. So f double prime of 2 means we plug 2 into here. So you get 6 times 2, which is 12. So if you get a positive number here, what does that mean? It means you have a minimum, a local minimum right there. And if you do f double prime of negative two, you just plug negative two in there, you get negative 12, which means we have a local maximum here. So all you're looking at is the sign, positive, minimum, negative, maximum. And if you want to actually get the, uh, the points, not just the, the x value of the points, but the actual points, then what you would do is you would plug 2 into the original, and you would plug negative 2 into the original. So let's plug 2 into here. You get 2 cubed minus 12 times 2 plus 5. That's 8 minus 24 plus 5, which is negative 16 plus 5 is negative 11. If you put negative two in here, you get negative two cubed minus 12 times negative two plus five. That's negative eight plus 24 plus five. That's 16 plus five is 21. So there's your local minimum and local maximum by using the second derivative test. Uh, should I show you just very, very quickly? I just want to remind you how we could have done the same thing by using the first derivative. What we would have done is explored these three intervals and we would have plugged them in right here. So for example, 10. 10 squared is 100 times 3 is 300. Take away this is definitely still positive. It's positive, which means it's increasing. In here, put 0. 0, take away 12, that's negative. means it's decreasing. Try a number down here like negative 10. Negative 10 squared is 100 times 3 is 300. Take away 12, it's still positive. This is increasing. If it goes increase and then decrease, we have a maximum at negative 2. Yep, that's what we found. If it goes decrease and then increase, we have a minimum at positive two, and that's what we found. So that's how you use it with the first derivative, which I prefer, or you could do the second derivative. You do have to know both. Okay, we're gonna sketch a curve on the back here. I wanna just draw a few sketches for you here. Um, there's four possible situations when you're sketching. You could have a curve that's increasing and concave up, 
or increasing and concave down, or decreasing and concave up, or decreasing and concave down. And I just want to show you what those look like. So if something's increasing and concave up, that would look like this. Yeah. It's definitely increasing and it's concave up. If it's increasing but concave down, it would look like this. It's going up, it's increasing, but it's concave down. If it's decreasing but concave up, that looks like this. And if it's decreasing but concave down, that looks like that. So it's good to be able to picture those when you're doing your sketches. Okay, so we're going to find the local minimum and maximum values of the function, blah, blah, blah. Use these along with concavity and points of inflection to sketch the curve. In other words, we have to do almost everything here. Why don't we even get our intercepts to start? So y-intercept, easy. Just plug 0 into the x's, right? So you'd have f of 0 equals 0 minus 0, it's 0. So you have a y-intercept at 0. Let's get the x-intercepts. How do you do that? Put 0 into the y or the f of x. So you get 0 equals 1 quarter x to the fourth minus 2x cubed. And I don't like this, uh, this 4, this denominator here. Let's multiply everything by 4. So you get 0, 4 times 0 is 0, equals 4 times a quarter is just 1, so I have x to the fourth, minus 4 times 2 is 8x cubed. Now I could factor. Take out an x cubed, and you're left with x minus 8, which means you have one x-intercept at 0. You already kind of knew that. And you have the other x-intercept at 8. This is useful information, and this is useful information. Okay, let's start taking our derivative now. f prime of x equals, okay, the 4 comes down and multiplies by the 1 quarter, and just equals 1. That's great. So then you have x cubed minus 3 comes down, multiplies to 2, 6x squared. And we need to get our critical values. Whether you do first derivative test or second derivative test, you need your critical values or critical numbers. So we want to know when is it that this doesn't exist? It always does. When is it that it equals 0? Well, factor out an x squared and you'll get critical numbers at x equals 0 and x equals 6. So at this point, if you wanted to use the first derivative test, you'd put 0 and 6 in here and you'd try those numbers uh, right here, the intervals. Sorry, you try your intervals right in there. Maybe I'll come back and do that after. But I think in this uh, section they want you to keep going with the second derivative test. So for the second derivative test, we take the derivative of the first derivative, so 3 comes down, 3x squared, 2 comes down, minus 12x. So then what you want to do is you want to plug your critical numbers into the second derivative. So f double prime of 0 and f double prime of 6 equals equals. Okay, if you put 0 in here, you get 0 minus 0 equals 0. What's that mean? That means it tells us nothing. This is totally not helpful if it equals 0. I hate this about the second derivative test. So what would you have to do now? You'd have to use the first derivative test. Well, why didn't you just use it in the first place and you wouldn't even have to worry about this? Uh, can you see I really don't like the second derivative test? Okay, so we can do this one, I guess, uh, but what's the point? We're going to do the first derivative test anyway. But I would put 6 in here. So I'd have 3 times 6 squared minus 12 times 6. That's 3 times 36 minus 72. That's 108 minus 72. So I get 36, which is positive. And because it's positive, that means the opposite of what you might actually think. It's a minimum, not a maximum. Um, OK, but remember, we have to go back and use the first derivative anyway, because this was not helpful. So back we go to here. I already kind of set it up. Let's try our values, and we're going to plug them into this uh, box part here. Oh, by the way, this is squared, so you don't even have to look at that. All you have to look at is this here, the x minus 6. So if a number is bigger than 6, like 8, 8 minus 6 is positive, it's increasing. Number between 0 and 6, like 2, 2 minus 6 is negative 4, so it's negative, decreasing. And number less than 0, like negative 10, negative 10 minus 6 is very negative, so this is also decreasing. Here it goes from decreasing to decreasing, that's not a maximum or minimum. Here it goes from decreasing to increasing, decreasing, increasing, oh, that's a minimum. So we have a local minimum at 6. And we already knew that we had a local minimum at 6 from the second root of test. Okay, so let's write down all the stuff we know so far. Uh, we need to write down when is it increasing, and when is it decreasing, and the maximum, and minimum, local maximum, minimum. So when is this graph increasing? It's increasing when it's bigger than 6. So from 6 to infinity. 
when's it decreasing? It's decreasing from negative infinity to zero and also from zero to six. When's there a maximum? None, there is no maximum. When's there a minimum? At the x value of six and what we'd like to know is what's the y value at that point? So we gotta take six and plug it back in to the original function right here. Oh my gosh, six to the fourth power. So I'll squish that in here. F of six equals one quarter times six to the fourth minus two times six cubed. So it equals one quarter times 1,296 minus two times 216. So a quarter of 1,296 is 324 and two times 216 is 432. If you subtract that, you get negative 108. So that is the y value of our minimum, negative 108. So all this is very useful information. What do we still have to get? Local minimum we got, maximum we got, uh, concavity and points of inflection. We still need to do that. So how are we going to do that? We're going to look for pips. So remember, what you do is you take the second derivative, which is right here, and you're going to ask yourself, when does that not exist? It always exists. When does it equal zero? Well, let's figure that out. 3x squared minus 12x equals zero. You could factor out a 3x. You're left with x minus 4 equals zero. So you end up with uh, x equals zero and x equals four. These are your pips, right? Your potential inflection points. That's just a made up term of mine, so don't be quoting me on that one. Uh, so we're gonna put these numbers on here, zero and four. And we're gonna try those intervals. Where are we gonna try them? Right here. So if I put a number up here like five, three times five, that's positive. Five minus four, that's positive. Positive and positive is positive. What's that mean about this area? It's concave up. Between zero and four, like two, three times two, positive. Two minus four, negative. Positive times negative, negative, which means this is concave down. Less than zero, negative 10. Three times negative 10, negative. Negative 10 take away four, negative. Negative times negative, positive. So these are concave up. So we can say that the graph is concave up from negative infinity up to zero, as well as from four to infinity and it's concave down from zero to four. Last thing we need are the inflection points, and there are two inflection points because we've got a change of sign here and a change in sign here. So you gotta plug these numbers, zero and four, back into your original function. Well, zero is really easy. You actually already know the point. You already know it goes through zero, zero. And sure enough, if you plug zero in there and zero in there, you get zero, zero. So that's very nice. One of our inflection points is zero, zero. And the other inflection point is when you have a y uh, x value of four. So we need to figure out what's f of four. I guess I'll do that here. So you would go one quarter times four to the fourth. minus two times four cubed. So that's a quarter of 256 minus two times 64. A quarter of 256 is 64 minus 132, which gives you negative 64 as your inflection point. More important information. We've got all the information we need. It's time to graph this thing. Okay, what are important x values? Zero, eight, we've got a minimum at six, and inflection points at four. So zero, four, six, eight, I think, are the good ones. So why don't we just go up by two here? We've got zero, two, four, six, eight. Two, four, six, eight. And it goes through zero, zero, so we've got a point right here. Uh, four, negative 24. What's the lowest we've got? We had one that was way down at negative 108. So I'm gonna go down by 20s. 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, 140. Now I'll label those. Negative 20, negative 40, negative 60, negative 80, negative 100, negative 120, negative 140. There we go. So we have our zero, zero point. I have another point at four, negative 24, which is somewhere right around there. I have another point at 6, negative 108, 
six, negative one, oh, eight, somewhere around there. And then we had eight, zero. That was another one of our uh, x-intercepts. So now we need to look at where it's concave up and down and where it's increasing, decreasing. So first of all, let's look at when it's below zero. When it's below zero, it's decreasing. And when it's below zero, it's also concave up. So concave up and decreasing. That would look something like this. Now, between zero and four, it's concave down and it is still decreasing, right? From zero to four is right in here and still it's still decreasing. We want it concave down and decreasing. So that would look like this, right? Look up here if you're not sure. Concave down and decreasing looks just like this and that's exactly what I just drew right there. Now this is our inflection point, so we should change to a concave up. Yes, the rest of our graph is all gonna be concave up and from four to six it is still decreasing from four to six so we're going to be decreasing but concave up all the way to here and then we are increasing after six increasing from six onwards so it's going to come up now and go through here and that is our graph and I don't know why it made the arrow so big, but this is it. And, you know, it's not perfect, but uh, it's a pretty good sense of what the graph looks like. Look at, that's a pretty confusing graph there, and we have managed to do a pretty nice um, approximation of what the graph looks like. So that's one question, and look at all the work you did. Show that to some of your grade eight friends or brothers or sisters and blow their minds. So we're never gonna survive.